But I don't assume you are going to be able to understand absolutely everything. I just like you to try to follow along whatever happens and, you know, in a kind of uh, high level uh, way. Then you're going to be, uh, you actually need to spend some extra time by your own, your own and try to understand uh, what's going on. Okay? All right, so uh, let's go to the second part of our talk, which is going to be artificial neural nets. And we start with the supervised learning classification in this case. So we are gonna do we are gonna try to do some some fun stuff, okay, and see how neural network try to uh, solve this kind of problem. So our initial point is gonna be trying to uh, generate nice colored spirals, right? Because everyone likes spirals, uh, nice colored spirals. So uh, if you just uh, draw this guy, uh, the equation of this guy is simply a parametric formula uh, of this form, right? So it's not nothing fancy. It just has like a sine cosine term, which is starting from, uh, you know, goes up to 2t, where t goes from 0 to 1. And then you have that uh, it goes from actually 2t divided by c, where c is the number of categories. So in this case, uh, capital C is 3. So we have three different categories. We have three different uh, branches, branches of that spiral. And they go up to basically 2 divided by C, which is 2 thirds. So this first guy it starts in this direction here. And it goes like 1 third, 2 thirds. See? So it ends up here. Uh, this guy, second one, it starts this direction. This is first third. And this is second third. So it ends up there. And the last guy here, it starts with this direction here. Uh, this is going to be my first third, and then this is second third. So as you can see, uh, this, with this parametric formula, we can express uh, that pretty drawing there. All right. So we now, now we know how to draw uh, some lines. Uh, but we need to get some data, right? Because anytime we'd like to perform supervised learning, what did I say before? Uh, what is supervised learning? We have a sample. With and we have a label, right? So what are my samples here? So I'm going to start ja now generating these samples. So I get the same thing here. It's the same formula, I think. Yeah. Uh, I add some, some disturbance here, some noise. And so this is whatever ends up uh, looking like. So these are going to be my data points. So one data point here is going to be a point in a plane, right? So each of these points here is represented by a x and y coordinate on this space. And the label is going to be basically uh, specifying whether this point is purple or it's red or it's yellow, right? And what we'd like to do is basically train our algorithm in order to assign the correct color given that I provide a position on the screen, okay? So these are all this collection of points are going to be my training points, my samples. And the samples are expressed by 2D coordinates. There is the X coordinate and the Y coordinate. The point at the end is going to be having a machine learning algorithm, in this case a neural network, which given a two, two coordinates, like an X and Y coordinate, is going to give me a categorical uh, value, which is going to tell me, oh, this point here, I think it should belong to the purple spiral, it should belong to the red one, it should belong to the yellow one, okay? So we are just trying to categorize these points as belonging to a specific spiral. You can play with the code later on and add more spirals, add more points, less points, you can play a lot and understand better the uh, difficulties of this problem. But so far, it should be clear, right? So given a point in the plane, uh, we'd like to learn the color of the point, right? And the point, the colors we learn by uh, using the C. So the C is the class, the specific class. And the capital C is the number of total classes we have. All right. So um, what we are going to be trying to do, uh, so what, what we hope the network is going to be performing, is some sort of uh, division of the class, of the space. So in this case, I'd like to say, oh, everything that is here belongs to, let's say, if I just look to this small region, Everything that belongs here is red. Everything that is here is yellow. Everything that is here is purple. The issue is that uh, those spirals are not linearly separable. So if I just draw some lines and I say everything here is red, well, not really. 
stuff red is happening here. Here we have some purple. We also have some yellow. So whenever uh, you use, like, let's say, a linear classifier, um, so it would be basically just drawing some lines like this. And we're going to be soon seeing that neural networks are simply a somehow uh, stuck in multiple linear classifiers together with some uh, non-linearities in between. But basically, what we are trying to do is draw some lines and getting data to stay within some specific region. So how does a neural network perform this stuff? Uh, a neural network will do this, basically. It gets the space and it starts rotating the space in order to uh, disentangle those representations. So anytime we use a neural net, we have some kind of disentangling operation. And at the end, I can simply use a linear classifier as the one that is shown in the last animation. Over here, I can say everything that is, is yellow here, everything that was here, it was purple, and everything that is up above here is red. Okay? So my last layer in a neural net is a linear classifier, again, which is drawing those three lines. And the other lay layers in between are just performing this kind of dewarping. So someone can say, ha, huh. someone say, ha, huh. okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I know how to rotate things, right? How do you rotate things? You're a physicist, you know how to rotate stuff. With, uh, matrices. with matrices, right? Okay, very well, right? So if you come here and you rotate this spiral, what's happened? It's like you have those kind of wind things. Same thing. So they still rotate, but they don't disentangle. It's a question there? Yeah. You can ask the question. Uh, that last slide, was that a real like deconstruction of a network that solved this problem, or was that just your animation? Um, it is actually going between the first layer to the last layer and back to the first one. So you, you, the, the answer that you found, the program that you found to solve this, literally provide, does exactly that transformation? Absolutely, yeah. OK, cool. So, and that's what I was going to say. But how I draw that? It's not that way. I mean, you can do... That's an interesting question too, yeah. To make things look pretty, I draw them my way. But that's how the network is going to be. I see. Be. So it is, it is a cartoon. It's a cartoon, but I'm showing you not cartoons in one minute. Okay. So, yeah. So, yes and no. It was advertisement and real cartoon will come later. That's correct. And they look exactly the same. So, but this is like what we hope it does, right? So the problem here is that if you use a matrix, you can rotate this guy here, but it's going to be like those little colored things with the air, right? They still rotate, but the things are still intertwined, right? And the thing that we are actually uh, aiming here is to rotate the space and warp the space with different kind of rotation given the different position from the center of the space, right? So we have a non-rotation here and a stronger rotation as we move uh, away from the center, okay? So basically, the neural network is going to perform some kind of space warping uh, through the layers. This is basically seeing things from the input space. As you move across to the output, this is the output space view. Back to the input, back to the output space. If usually, uh, this is not the way you see those things. The way you usually see those things are from the output of these networks, which are these kind of graphs. So this is my network training. Uh, at the beginning, it doesn't know anything. And as, as it trains, it tries to shape its own understanding by following this, uh, this drawing. And this is not a cartoon. This is actually the training part. So the point is that this shape that it has learned, basically, if you, this is like the looking at the output from the input. That one basically is just looking uh, through the network. Uh, but they are basically the same operation. So we are trying to basically have a network which is going to be learning that this region here belongs to the yellow, this region belongs to the purple, this region is belongs to the red uh, class. And is it clear so far? Are you excited? <laughs> Shall we move on? Yes. Very well. And then, oh, training data. Huh. No, let's make a demo. So I'm going to show you something cool um, here. Possibly, yes. So I'm going to go back to my notebooks, and I'm going to be just running quickly the uh, space stretching. Um, so here, I really don't want you to read anything. I'm just showing you very pretty pictures. 
Okay, so this is my initial distribution. Here I have just some Gaussian points, okay? So uh, you have just a spread of points uh, in the two direction with, you know, uh, diagonal matrix with uh, unitary uh, variance. Okay, just points in the center. Uh, just forget whatever I said before. Uh, if you multiply those guys by a matrix, what does it happen? So someone said, oh, it's a matrix, right, for rotating. Well, that's, yes. That, so here I multiply this stuff by a matrix. This is my, this is my input. Here is by this guy. Uh, this guy has this uh, eigenvalue here, right? 2.6 and 3.0.3. So you get the 6 and the reduction in the other direction, right? So this is whatever happens with that. whenever you multiply by matrix. You get some squash in one direction. You get some stretch in the other direction. You get also some uh, rotation, right? But everything is rotated the same way in the space because it's a linear transformation, right? Uh, here you have a different matrix. So you have a very, very, very tiny eigenvalue in this direction, a very large eigenvalue the other one. So this is nothing new, right? This is simply matrix multiplication with very pretty colors, right? You, you like the colors, right? Good. All right, so more matrices, more matrices. Uh, so here, both of those eigenvalues are very large, so everything gets expanded. So you understand, right? Small, eigenval small eigenvalues, things get collapsed. Larger eigenvalues, things get uh, expanded. And so on, blah, 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 very nice drawings. All right, so how can we do that in PyTorch? So in PyTorch, we do exactly the same, but we, do, we use something that is called nn.linear. Can you see here? So nn.linear is just using a matrix and multiply by your input, exactly the same. So although it's called nn, just forget, it's just a linear transformation. And here, exactly the same. This is one of the basically examples we have seen before. All right, so let's do something more fun. Let's introduce a non-linearity. So in here, I just multiply my x with identity times s to scale. So this is my scaling matrix, which is just scaling. It doesn't rotate anymore because it has the same guy in both directions here. And we have a tan h. Do you know hyperbolic tangent? Right? OK, good. <coughs> All right, so let's try to, write, to, to run some stuff. OK, so this is my hyperbolic tangent first. Uh, every, everything that is below minus 5 is basically set down to minus 1. Everything that is above plus 5 is basically 1. As you approach the 0, uh, you get basically a linear part in the center, and you get this kind of S shape. So this is also called a sigmoid function, sort of. Um, all right. So, and let's put here a sequence of a linear, tr linear transformation. Can you see here? And a tan h, OK? So let's see what happens here. So here I have my input, which is my scatter in the two direction. And here I have my scaling factor equal 1. So I scale things a little bit. Uh, actually, I don't scale. I have the same scaling. But then I, I use this tan h. So things that are above here uh, get pushed to 1. So everything that is outside the uh, plus 5, we have, seen, we have said, it goes to 1. So up, everything here goes up to 1. And things that are where below, uh, OK, let me show you the other graph here. So everything that is outside this region, it gets pushed towards 1. Everything that is uh, in this region gets pushed to minus 1. The same for up and below, right? So we get this kind of nice cloud shaped as a square here. Does it make sense so far? We are applying a nonlinearity to some kind of zooming factor, right? So what does it happen now if we increase the zooming factor? Go more. There, there you go, correct. So everything goes more. And if I push more, everything goes even more. And even more, right? And even more. And again, you understand, right? So the, the whole point here is that we have converted that initial cloud, which was very dense of many, many things. We pushed everything on the, on the side. And we have a few samples here that are very, very disentangled. So here you can already see how things get pushed away, and, and we have different stretching in different regions, right? So here, these guys are very stretched, and here, things are very collapsed. Remember before what we were trying to do? It was we were trying to warp with different amount, different regions. The same thing we see here. Here, things are very expanded, 
and things here are very con uh, collapsed, right? So if I go up ab above the other one, here you can see a more smooth transition, right? Here, things are very, very, very pressed together, and here are much less pressed together. You can also uh, apply some rotation if you don't have just the identity matrix there. Okay, so this is just uh, showing you how I map a cloud of points into a square. And the nice part is now that if I'm just running a neural net, basically a sequence of a linear mapping, a non-linearity, and a linear mapping without, just with random weights, without uh, training anything, and I apply this stuff to my little cloud here, you're going to see some very pretty pictures. So this is simply uh, a random neural net applied to that initial cloud, right? So these are my initial points. And here I apply these uh, 2D coordinates into my network. And this is the output of my network. And you can see here uh, just uninitialized neural nets can perform some very nice squashing and pushing data around. Okay? So we are going to be using this stuff uh, in order to uh, push space around and de-warp that spiral in a bit. Questions so far? No? Are you with me? Are you sleeping? Are you OK? <laughs> Are you interested? Yes. OK, good. All right, so Is we have an intuitive explanation of why there seem to be different numbers of lines in these. Uh, so that seems to have like very clearly two edges, maybe. Yes, point. yes, yes. So if you check here, uh, there is a number which is called number of hidden layers. So in here, we go from dimension of 2, which is the space, the input space, the coordinates on, this, on, the, on the plane. We go up to 5 dimensions, which is a 5-dimensional space. And then from 5-dimensional space, you go down to 2. So when you have this kind of expansion, you can start pushing and moving things around. And you get a lot of degrees of freedom there. So was each of these images want the output of one of the layers? That, that those images that you just see there, yeah. they are simply random initialized uh, matrices with a non-linearity in between, and I feed them inside, and I just show you what a, a neural network can perform on those points on a plane. Okay. And the, and the color, color text stays with the point. Right? Well, the color stays with the x direction of the uh, initial position here. So the color here express of the initial, the initial so stays in yes, yes, yes. All right, so uh, all we have to do now is basically um, get some kind of control over how these networks perform this kind of funky uh, shapes, right? So if only we would know how to change those parameters in order to enforce some specific dewarping, right? So all we have to do now is get in those spiral things and start performing some dewarping, which allows me to dewarp that kind of uh, intricate spiral. And that can be done uh, very easily with Torch, just with one few, a few lines of code. All right, so how much time do we have left? Half an hour. Half an hour. Ooh, okay, it's a lot. All right. So, all right. So, so we have understood that these neural networks, even if they are not trained, they can perform some uh, space. OK. <laughs> it was completely empty. I was yes, surprised. I'm aware. I can see. Thank you. All right. So uh, we have seen now that this, these neural networks can perform some kind of space warping. No? They get some points I showed you before, and they map them in different regions. And we have now to control them. We have to enforce some way in order to move those points in specific ways, right? Those warp, warp things, we won't like to move them around. And so let's just do that. How? The few next slides. So, I have just one question. Yes. So when you're making this movement, if it's not, should it be always area, should, should it be connected or not? Because that's what I'm saying. So when you have a movement, the, if you have uh, two points which are connected, they always will stay the same. But if you have, for example, with this dot, one area which is red and around is blue and again around is red, then you don't have movement which will put all red together. So, Okay, very well. Yes. Understood. yes, I understood. So uh, I'm trying to uh, 
repeat the questions. So uh, here, the, the guy in the first row, he asked, so if we have some points in the center, let's say red points here, then we have like a crown, uh, like a ring of green points, and then we have external other points in red. How would we manage to move these guys? So can we, can we put together things that are, are not on the same uh, plane? Not, not connected. Not connected. So can we do something like that? Yes, that we can by adding additional dimensions. So we were on a 2D plane, but if you switch to a 3D plane, you can get the red stuff, uh, which was the, 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 the ring. You pull it this direction, and the other guy, you put them here. And this way, then you can just cut this way. Okay. All right. So training data. We need to now put the data in a way that we can use it for uh, training. So first of all, we are going to be defining a matrix uh, X, which is our, it's called design matrix. In my rows, I have those kind of X with the bar, which simply represent vectors. And here I have my first vector, which is like the coordinate of my first point in my uh, spiral plot, okay? So you get, I get the first point there, and I put here, one number, two number, second number. Then I get the second point, number two, I get the first coordinate, second coordinate, and I go down until the last point I have in my spiral, first coordinate, x, and second coordinate, okay? Are you sure you understand? Okay, very well. All right, so this one is simply the collection of all my x points. How many points do I have? M, so M is gonna be representing the number of training samples I'm using for training my system. What is N? N, instead, is the size of my features. In this case, since we are having points in a space, in a plane, the space, the, the n is going to be just two. We have two coordinates, right? So in this case, given two coordinates, uh, x and y, and given m examples, I'm going to try to learn those three different labels. Okay? Right, good. Second point, we have to see which are the labels of the classes. So for every example here, we had the 1, 2, up to the m example in my data set. <coughs> I have my C1, so it's the class of the first example. Then I have C2, second class. CM, last class. So, uh, sorry, the last example. So this one could be red, this can be purple, this could be yellow, okay? So these are categorical, um, uh, like, bit of information, which are connected directly to my design matrix. So therefore, this is a matrix of size M times N, Whereas this guy is simply a vector of dimension m. Good? Yes? All right. One more. So what is this? Ha. All right. So these are actually my real labels. Because this guy here represent whether it is red, it is yellow, it is uh, whatever. But I have to uh, represent this kind of information in a more uh, computer-like way. I cannot say, oh, this is red, this is yellow. So we are going to use these kind of y uh, vectors. So there is a line underneath. If I just draw them with a computer, I just make them bold. This is just to show you they should be bold if they would be drawn by computer. So this is my label, which is somehow built with this guy, associated to the first example. This is the computer label for the second example, and so on and so on. So we have M labels. And in this case, we have capital C classes items. So can you guess what is going to be the representation of the label for the machine? Does anyone can uh, have an idea? Could be RGB, but let's say it could be 1 to 3, but again 1 to 3 it, uh, it infers some order. So 1 becomes, it comes before 2, right? And here I already show you that the size of these guys is capital C. One hot. It's going to be a one hot encoding. What is this stuff? So this stuff means if you belong to the first class, you're going to be a vector one zero zero. If you belong to the second class, you're going to be zero one zero, and so on, right? So I just draw a one when you <coughs> belong to a specific uh, class, and in this way I don't uh, enforce any kind of categorical sorting order. Okay? And, and this so is called. Sorry. Yes. Are we doing this like to be probabilities at the end? Uh, you don't have to, but this is in order to be uh, defining later on a cost function which we are going to be using to train the system. But, uh, yeah, it can be used for uh, a probability later on, but um, 
Okay, you can see this one about uh, as like what is the probability of the, this point to belong to the first class? This one, so 100% first class, 0%, 0%, okay? So it can be also expressed and thought about in that way. Okay, so far, good? Yes, no? Yes. People are not moving their head. Okay, someone is moving their head. So someone's still alive. All right, so here, xi, which is my ith sample, it's simply a point in Rn, and in our case, it's just uh, n is 2, because it's a point in the space. Uh, m instead is the number of the samples in the, in the data set. Uh, in this case here, my y instead uh, is like belonging to Rc, where capital C is the number of classes, and C is, well, it actually is not Rc, it's going to be like uh, a set 0, 1, right, times C. Uh, power to the C. And C in this case is 3 because we have 3 spirals. And the last one uh, are going to be my classes CI, which is like basically a number from 1 to capital C. All right, so um, let's move on. So in here, I would show you how to draw the spirals with uh, torch. I think we can move on uh, because it's simply just uh, drawing those spirals things. I think it's more cool if we are going to be actually getting some uh, results. So I would recommend you to just go through the data generation by your own later on after we are done. So let's see now, finally, how and what are these neural networks, right? So we have <laughs> spoken about those cute and fancy things, but let's see how they work. So in here I show you a three-layer neural network. This guy here is my input X, which is fed inside this first guy, first second guy here. So we have one, two, and three layers. Uh, there is one guy in the center, which is uh, called H, because it's hidden in the center of the network. And then I have here my output over on the top. Networks go from the bottom to the top. If you see them drawn from top to bottom, you're wrong. Just, you know, just st stick with this notation, please. All right, so uh, how, what is the uh, equation that is basically governing this neural net? So my uh, hidden representation h is simply a nonlinear function f, which is pointwise apply applied to this guy here. So this guy here simply is you know a, an affine transformation of on this vector x, right? Do you understand this <coughs> nomenclature? I mean, you're you're all physicists and you already seen matrices. We know, we know what is affine transformation. So you know, right? I mean, others who, also know, not only me. Who who doesn't know what an affine transformation is? Just to see, you know, right? You're not undergraduates. I mean, we somehow little bit graduate, yes. All right, so all right, so I, I just keep going, right? Just yes, stop yes, me. Okay. If, all right, thank you, because I I'm not sure. So here we have an affine transformation of my input x, right? Uh, I have a bias term which is just shifting, and I have a linear transformation here. I call W H which is mapping my input to the hidden space. And here is a nonlinear function applied pointwise to every element of this, of this vector here. Uh, the same way, I just keep doing the same operation, and I have my y hat, which is my predicted output, which is again a nonlinear function applied to this affine transformation. And this affine transformation is applied on the hidden space, the hidden layer, okay? So you have an input, a fine transformation, no linear function, a fine transformation, no linear function, output. Good? All right. Yes, question. Why, why the hidden layer? Why not just have a nonlinear function from input to output? Say again? Why do we need a hidden layer? Why can't we just have... Because you would have shallow networks and they don't... Uh, they, they, so if you have one layer only, you only can do the, the squaring thing. Uh -huh. And you can only do, so if you have a fine transformation, you have seen before, you can stretch things, you can push them, you can rotate, but you cannot do warping, you cannot do uh, those fancy uh, diagrams we have seen. So as soon as you stack two guys of this guy, those, those two guys here, you start seeing all those fancy uh, behavior that those neural networks that I just generated before without any kind of uh, meaningful weight were showing, okay? So that's basically it. So this is a neural network. Oh, there's no, really, there's not much more than this. We're going to see some more stuff tomorrow, which we are going to be introducing other cool stuff, but that's pretty much it. Everyone is okay with this thing? No issues, right? We don't, we are not afraid of this guy. 
Right, good. All right, so what are these guys? Simply, I guess, but I guess you know. So this guy here maps from the uh, input space, the N, to this D space, which is our internal dimensionality. And therefore, my bias is going to be also uh, on size D, right? Because we are going to be summing a, a fine, like this linear transformation going from N to D, and then you want to sum also D. And the same guy here, right? This is going to be outputting C classes because we are going to be expecting that kind of one hot sort of uh, representation. So C classes going from D. And then the other guy here is going to be also capital C because it has to be in the same size given that we are summing. All right, so what are these F and Gs? These F and Gs are, again, nonlinear function applied pointwise, so for element wise. Uh, they can be simply the positive part of a function. They can be a logistic sigmoid. They can be tan H, the one I showed you before. They can be some Boltzmann def uh, like distribution thing. Uh, you can just put there any kind of nonlinearity. So some are more used than others. I won't go into much details. Uh, this one is very nice. Uh, you know, very, uh, so you're a physicist, right? All of you. No. Not all. Who is not a physicist? But you know Boltzmann, right? Okay, so Personally, yes. <laughs> all right, so you know this guy. So this is simply a Boltzmann distribution. All right, and so the overall, this the summary of this slide is that basically my y hat, which is my prediction here, is basically a function of my input, which is fed down there, and then y hat goes from the input space to this kind of categorical space where we are representing different classes. And here we go again, mapping the input to its own class, okay? All right, um, but this one can also be seen as mapping N space to a D space, which is potentially larger, and then we go out, out to the final uh, capital C class, where the dimension of the internal space is larger than this device here. So we go from two dimensions to a larger space, maybe five dimensions, and then we go down to, actually, we go to three, because it's our uh, three classes, classes, right? Questions so far? Is that necessary for the intrinsic layer to have higher dimension than the... <coughs> so, yes, for the reason he asked before. So how would you separate things that are uh, not connected? So you need to push things in a higher dimension. Uh, this is very true also when you deal with, like, uh, even larger inputs like images or audio, audio and all, all those things, you really need to go in larger dimension in order to move things. So if things are in small dimensions, you cannot push things around because everything is like just packed. So first, push everything away, like larger space, and then you can just get things and move them around much easily. So it's not, as soon as you increase the number of dimension, you, much, you have much more freedom of pushing things in different direction without being constrained of moving other stuff. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. How many dimensions should you pick? Like, how do you know five? I, you cross-validate. So you're going to be trying empirically and see what it works better. Other things, other questions? Yes. So how do you determine the bias term? Um, it's gonna, I didn't tell you anything, right, so far. These guys are coming from the sky, no, Some, someone gave you. So no one told you anything. I, I, haven't, I haven't said that. Other questions? Are you ready to see how we, how we train this stuff? Are you excited? <laughs> okay. I, he's not hired. I don't know this guy. We didn't prepare this before. <laughs> All right. All right. So, okay. So, again, then you're going to be bored, right? So, this guy is two dimensional because it's a point in the space. This guy is ooh, 100 dimensional, it means you have so much freedom. And the last one there, it's a three dimensional because there are three classes. All right. What's next? I guess it was the tutorial. Let's skip that. So, you're putting two dimensional space in three dimensional space. Uh, yes, but going through the 100, right? I agree, so agree, I go agree. from 2 to 100 to 3. Okay. Are you okay so far? <laughs> okay. All right. But you're going from 2 to 3, so I mean, 2 is 2, oh, I see, 2 to the power, oh, okay. So you're just going from a two dimensional space to a three dimensional so space? So I go from my point in a, a plane to a 
probability defined over the number of classes. I see. This is what I do. So I start from two dimension and I end up with C, capital C classes dimension. Okay. So n dimension to start, capital C to end up. Other questions before I go on? There you go. All right. So I'm skipping all the demos. And so this is the Boltzmann equation I showed you before. So what is the softmax? Softmax over a vector, it's simply the uh, exponential of that specific element divided by the summation of the all other exponentials. So this one basically, uh, given a vector of whatever um, energies, you get the distribution of probability on which, uh, on those energies, okay? So actually, yes, there's, there's gonna be a minus. We don't care because we just learned the negative energy. So yes, absolutely, there should be a minus if you're a physics, physicist, I'm not. But yes, uh, yes, you can put a minus, nothing changes. Uh, those are called just for uh, convention logit. So that's the definition of logit is the input of the softmax. I'm confused because you say that it's it's either zero or one. Uh, no, I see this the is an open. Of, oh, the open interval, interval zero to one. I'm sorry. Yeah, zero to one excluded the. Uh, right, right, uh, right. All right. So what is this stuff? I define now finally something. So we are going to be defining. A cost a loss function so that I can run a optimization something an optimization uh, uh, you know program which is going to be trying to minimize a specific cost by performing this uh, optimization we are going to be basically straighten up that final uh, warp space that the kind of spiral right so the whole point of uh, defining this loss here is going to be basically telling the network how we'd like uh, the final result to look like uh, finally, right? So we have to define, we have to ask the network, okay, network, please perform a specific task. The task is gonna be try to lower as much as it can this kind of cost. By lowering this cost, it's gonna be translated as in warping that space accordingly to different uh, strengths, okay? So this is like the, uh, without mathematics, now let's try to see what is this. So I have here my loss function, capital L, defined on the whole capital Y, which is the whole set of labels. It's just the average of those per sample uh, losses, okay? So this is an average of those per sample losses. And my per sample loss, it's simply <laughs> the minus log of the correct class on my prediction. What does it mean? Let's see an example. So this is also called cross entropy or negative log likelihood. So let's see for by, by example, we have my input here on the X and the correct class is one. And so my uh, predicted, the correct label should be one zero zero, okay? All right, so let's say my Y hat produces something that is very, very similar to one zero zero, okay? Very similar. So how is this loss uh, performing? So we are gonna get the minus log of the correct class. The correct class is one, right? So if I do minus log of this guy, so log of something slightly below one, how much is it? Log of one, zero. Log of almost one, a little bit below, minus zero, right? And given that we have minus here, we have zero plus. Okay, so given that our network produces an output like this one with this kind of uh, function again, then the loss is basically zero, a little bit more on the zero, but yeah, just zero. So if we predict the correct label, then the loss associated to predicting the correct label is zero, right? Good so far? Yes, no? Yeah, okay. What does it happen if we predict a wrong label? We are gonna have the loss on something that is almost zero. Almost zero. What is the log of almost zero? A bit negative. Negative infinity. Then we have minus here. So we're gonna be having this guy tending to plus infinity, okay? So predicting the wrong label 
it basically gives us a very, very, very high loss. Predicting a correct label gives us a zero loss. Okay? So now we have this guy here, this average loss, which is the average of all these per example losses. And these per example losses are going to be uh, the lowest whenever we have correct predictions. And they are very, very large whenever we have wrong predictions. Okay? Good? All right. I know, stay with me one more slide. And just, you know, uh, I, I still just borrow, borrow me your few neurons that are still working on your brain. And <laughs> let, let me finish up. All right. The last slide, seriously. So here I define my set of parameters as the collection of all these guys here that I draw, I show you before, which are just initialized with random values. They don't have specific values. It's like my neural network you had seen before. So the networks I showed you before, they were just randomly initialized neural nets with random values. And you were seeing those very fancy kind of uh, diagrams, right? What we are going to try to do now, we are going to be defining a kind of different loss function here, similar to the one we have seen before, in order is parameterized by this guy here. And then we are going to be changing this guy here in order to minimize this loss. Okay? I'm going to be a, a bit more uh, specific here. So here I'm defining this loss here, j of theta, as the previous L, as on the y function of theta. Right? So these one are my predictions which are a function of my parameters, right? And that's basically saying, okay, this is my loss expressed as in labels, true labels and my predictions, and this is my loss defined in the uh, parameters I use. <coughs> so it's simply just, bless you, it's just simply changing the vari variables, right? Here the loss is defined as predictions and targets. Here the, def the loss is defined as function of my parameters. Okay? Yes? No? Mm -hmm. All right. Are you sure? OK. Yeah. All right, so more drawings. We can think about this loss. For example, if we have one direction only, I have my, my lowercase theta, perhaps like a quadratic function. So if I'm here, how do I reach the minimum? H how do I get here? I look where is the slope going, right? So I just ee, go down the, 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 the hill, right? Uh, how do you look for the slope? You check what is it? What is this point here? What is the slope here? The slope here is going to be the derivative of my loss with respect to this guy right here, computed in theta zero, right? So this guy here expresses me the slope here. And if I'm here, I'd like to go that direction, right? So here the slope is positive, and I'd like to go to that direction. So if I have positive numbers, I'd like a minus here. So I go there. If I'm here, my slope is negative. So I put also a minus here, so I know that I had to go to positive numbers, right? So here we observe that in order to find the zero, we'd like to step towards the direction of negative gradient, which is of the loss function with respect to the parameter. I know, it's a mouthful. I hope you understand. Shall I repeat? No? Is it good? So it's just an optimization problem, right? All right. Finally, this is called gradient descent. You step towards the direction where the gradient is pointed against. To. Huh. All right. So what are these guys here? So this guy is partial derivative of my loss function with respect to this first parameter here, which is basically you know chain rule. And so it's just the loss uh, by the y and then dy in the w. And this guy, given that is the Previous h is going to be still the chain rule, you know? And that's why we use PyTorch, because this guy here, uh, this, this is called back propagation, which is just the chain rule, and which is performed automatically by PyTorch. So PyTorch, whenever you perform operation with those tensors, remembers what operation you have performed. And therefore, if you have a sequence of operation, it's just basically as having a computational graph. Whenever you have the last guy, you can go back, and you get basically this expression here, expression there uh, automatically uh, computed for you. So 
We use PyTorch because there is a automatic differentiate, automatic differentiation uh, engine uh, behind those tensors, and it can memorize all the operations you have performed on those vectors, so that we can perform backpropagation with simply one line of code. And that was my last slide of theory. I'm going to be just showing you that this stuff actually works, if you would like. So shall we go on? And I'll show you. Okay. I don't care if you have questions, you're going to see me later, <laughs> because otherwise I won't show you anything anymore. All right, so back to the notebook here. I'm just going to be running the uh, spiral classification. Uh, it's the fourth, actually. I skipped the uh, automatic tutorial, uh, automatic differentiation. So this one, I was going to show you how those uh, computational graphs are generated and how the uh, chain rule is computed. But I guess uh, you can go through that by your own, your own. So here I'm just executing every line of this code like that. And there we go. So first part, which we also we skipped, was the generation of this data here, which is defined in a previous cell. And I just draw exactly the thing I, I showed you before in the uh, presentation. Um, Here we are tra training our network in order to minimize that j function, j, j of theta, uh, with respect to those. So we, we are basically updating those parameters in order to step towards the direction that is not pointed of the gradient, right? In the, in the direction opposite of where the gradient is pointing. And so we are going to be, I show you here that this network is simply a two layer. To, it has two different linear layers with a nonlinearities uh, in between. And then here, if I show you how it worked, well, sort of, not really, right? So it tried to, but it's still linear, right? What, what's, what's wrong here? So if we check the model, ha, here. So if you see this guy, my input x goes through this guy here, a linear, and then goes through another linear, and then the output. So I have two linear transformations. Well, nothing works, right? Because it's just linear. I want to warp things. So what do I have to add? A nonlinearity, right? So input, I put here a nonlinearity in between, and that's it. So we go down, same two layers network, right? I go down here, here you can see my output, my output here of this first affine transformation, it goes through a positive part function, and then the output of this positive part, it goes inside the other linear layer. So we have an affine transformation, a positive part, an affine transformation, and then output. Okay? So we just put a positive part between those two linear layers. That's all I've done. We are doing exactly the same thing, but can you Accuracy see here? Is wrong. Huh? Accuracy, it should be bigger or lower? Which one is better? Accuracy. I better, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, you should be. <laughs> right? So this is exactly, exactly the thing we have seen a few pages above with the three lines where there was no nonlinearity. Here I just added a positive part nonlinearity, and you have automatically that the network learns how to curve its own decision boundary in order to achieve the highest, well, actually to achieve the lowest um, loss possible on the training set. Is it clear? So, so the only difference between this guy here, which couldn't basically classify, we got like a accuracy of 50%, which is not that bad because we have three classes. Uh, 0.3 would be the uh, random, random guess. And so this one is the best performance you can get with linear models or shallow networks. And just using two layers, the same two layers we have used before by adding the, non, uh, the positive part uh, nonlinear pointwise function, we are managing to curve the space 
and perform this very nice separation. Questions, yes? It looks like the model is slightly overfitted. If you extend past the point in which the data was generated from, do you have any idea why that would be? Uh, you mean this one, right? Yeah, so like yeah, it goes right where the data ended. Right, 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 because um, that's a very good point. So the model capacity we are using, the model we are using is actually a very, very tiny model. There are just two layers, and actually the dimensionality uh, okay, 100 dimensions, maybe it's fine. So the 100 dimensions shows you this kind of curving here. But then all the power, the modeling power, has gone into shaping this curve here in order to maximize this separation of those points in, this, uh, in these classes here. And you're saying, ha, huh, why didn't this guy perform anything? Because here, anything it does, uh, this little curvature, it doesn't, um, it doesn't improve the... Uh, training loss, right? So if this guy goes this direction, or this direction, this direction, this direction, they don't change the uh, training loss too much, but they are actually changing a lot how well you manage here to shape this uh, curve. So the more you curve here, we and the, hold on, the more you curve here, and the less you can curve here. So you have a always kind of a trade-off between how well you can characterize uh, parts here, whether you can characterize in other places. Um, then it's correct. This is just my training set. I didn't show you, like, wh where are the actual uh, points belonging to a validation set? They may be here, and they we have, like, perfect, uh, you know, generalization, or they may actually happen to be here, and then we are going to have a very poor generalization. Can we increase yes. 100 up to 50 and repeat the set? The dimensionality, right? You, you said the hidden dimensions. Hidden dimensions. So first I want to degree to 50, and second, degree to 150. But I don't know how much term it will take, but for 50, it's possible to degree, right? So that, that's, that's why you have the notebook, right? So you, you have the notebook on your computer. Yeah, but first I need to manage to run this. So if it's easy, let's try here. <laughs> and then others also will see. Of course. <laughs> Um, here, so here we have defined uh, oh dimensions two. No, 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 no. Hold on. Yeah, I don't know where it's defined. Hold on. Oh, capital H. Okay, I see. All right. Capital H, here, oh, number of hidden units, yes. So you wanted 50. So I go here. I generate this guy with 50. There you go. 50, same, almost. Oh, okay, you can see here there is much less of a turning, right? Mm -hmm. So also here, there is much uh, larger region where the space is not banned uh, here and here. And the same here. And then if you actually enlarge this view, you're going to see that this stuff is going to be linear in this direction. This stuff is going to be linear in this direction. And this other guy here is also going to be linear, which is the thing that doesn't cost me uh, computation uh, modeling power. Okay. Now can we put 150? Yes, we can do 150. <laughs> why, why, why do we need that for an exercise for the? <laughs> All right. We'll just check and then we can go. Yes. <laughs> 150. There you go. Yeah, but. <laughs> Voila. And now you can see much, much, much of a smoother curve. Other questions? I think if we have two minutes, yes. The way we chose Y was like 1, 0, 0, 1. And then correspondingly, we chose our uh, cost function to be Y hat times C, minus log of Y hat times C. So uh, this can only do classification, right? So if I want to do something that's like a prediction problem. Yes, if you are going to be doing a prediction, you're going to be basically using an MSC, mean square error, where you're trying to see what is the quadratic distance between your uh, target and your own 
predictions. Okay? So that's a different cost function. And this is going to be a different cost function, that's correct. Uh, the other question? Could you add a fourth classification that just says it doesn't belong to either of them? Would that improve your accuracy but not add more computation or like a little bit of more computation? But which kind of samples would I put there? Just everything else. I mean, could you generate them? Or but where would you uh, put them? Right now we have three different classes. You yeah. can have, okay, but this applies for other, um, I understand your question. So maybe if you don't like face recognition, maybe you have like uh, five different identities and then you would like to have an other's identity. Is it something like that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So what I've seen that usually having the other category is bad because it tries to get all together. So uh, the network is going to try to put together things that are different rather than having more classes maybe. And that's actually easier because the network has to just group smaller regions. So these ones are just relatively small. If you have different things that are all around and you try to have them together, the network will try very hard to somehow push those things together. So the other category usually is not a very good idea in this case. Uh, one, more, one more question? No? If not, uh, thank you so much for listening. And if you have any other question, I will be you know, outside here. Thank you.